Do we love ourselves? One of the hardest things for any Catholic is to say, I love myself. We have this guilty or bad feeling that we should never say, I love myself. Yet that is exactly what we need to do to be a loving Christian. Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself. So in essence, Jesus is asking us to love ourselves. Maybe it is a false or misled understanding of true humility that leads us to think we should never love ourselves. Hello everyone, today's episode is about loving ourselves, why we need to love ourselves, and more importantly, what is the basis of this self-love? We can only obtain true humility when we can truly love ourselves for the right reason. Welcome to another episode of Practical Catholic with David Cease. Practical Catholic is a spiritual coaching show to help you find peace, love, and joy in family and work life. We are here each and every week to help you grow spiritually, to become successful in this life, and to be a saint for the life after. My story begins with my daughter. This was about several years ago when uh, I think, believe she turned about 13 years old. And uh, my daughter had a habit of um, asking my wife and I this question, do you love me? And it was getting to the point where uh, she was doing it uh, like at least three or four times a day for, um, I would say, almost every day. So, uh, you know, the first time she asked, I said, oh, yes, honey, I, I, I love you very much. And my uh, wife uh, would say the same thing. But as she kept saying, asking that question over and over again in a daily manner and, and for weeks and weeks, you kind of start getting a little bored of it. So, uh, so one day she asked that question, daddy, do you love me? And I looked at her and I said, honey, I love you a lot. And then I asked her, do you love yourself? And, um, she kind of looked back and, you know, uh, she was shocked to hear that question coming from me and she never, you could tell that she didn't even think about that, you know, think about the idea that do I love myself? And she said, kind of. And I looked at her and I said, kind of? She said, sort of, maybe. And then I, I continued and I said, honey, you should love yourself 100%. You know, you should have no doubts in loving yourself. And she was kind of a little embarrassed um, about that idea. So we as Catholics have this idea that we shouldn't really love ourselves, you know, um, and I think she was very embarrassed. And I don't think she even contemplated that. It wasn't just that, you know, uh, she didn't believe it. I don't. I think that she never even thought about it. You know, we want to be loved so much by other people that the first person that we should actually ask ourselves is, do I love who I am? And then the next question is, why? So... Um, just last weekend, I had a, um, a Franciscan meeting, and I'm teaching the Liturgy of the Hours uh, in front of uh, a lot of the MIM or, you know, these new uh, people who are um, possibly discerning to become a Franciscan tertiary. And so, you know, in that classroom, I probably had about, I want to say 15, uh, no more than 20 people in that, that room. So I asked these sets of questions. Okay, and I I dare you to contemplate while I'm asking these questions um, and have, you know, think about it. Think about these questions and you answer them yourself. And then as I'm explaining how they answered it, um, I will, you know, you think about it. So the first question I asked was, do you believe that Jesus and God the Father loves you? And everyone said enthusiastically, yes. They're all enthusiastic. Yes, Jesus loves me. God the Father loves me. The Holy Spirit loves me. That's an easy, that's a no-brainer. That's a good question. Then I said, and do you believe that Jesus loves you so much that he suffered and died for you? And again, all of them enthusiastically said, yes, I do. And there was no question about it, no doubt about it. That was definitely it. Then I asked the next question. I said, do you believe that Mary, our mother, Jesus' mother as well, loves you? And they emphatically said, yes, she does. 
Okay. I mean, these are no-brainer questions. These are, you know, if, if, you're, if you're a Christian, then you should know these answers are yes. Then I said, do you believe that baptism made you a child of God? And all of them said emphatically and enthusiastically, yes. Okay. Very simple questions, no-brainers. If you're a Christian, you definitely should believe in all this stuff, right? Then I said, now for the hardest question. Do you love yourself? And there were a couple of them said yes, enthusiastically. Others didn't answer at all. And some of them said, kind of, like my my daughter. Right? So I would say a third, 33% emphatically said, yeah, I love myself. And then another third probably said, you know, a kind of, sort of, maybe, and another third didn't answer at all. They didn't know how to answer that question. That answer should be, yes. Yes, I love myself. Now, that, that sounds kind of awkward, doesn't it? You know, especially, you know, Catholics, you know, about suffering and, you know, great saints are saying you're nothing and you're nobody. But in reality... You have to say that. You have to love yourself. And in fact, Jesus actually commands that we love ourselves. All right. You know, um, if you look at, look up Mark chapter 12, 31, the gospel of Mark. And, you know, the story goes like this. The story says that a, um, one of the doctors of the church uh, or, the, or the synagogue uh, theologian, basically, asked Jesus, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus says, the greatest commandment is love your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. That's the you know, first commandment. And, um, you know, Jesus is basically quoting Deuteronomy on that one. But then he adds, but there's a second commandment, okay? The second commandment is, and he even says, almost equal to the first commandment. And he says, the second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Oh, wait a second. Love your neighbor as yourself? You know, it only makes sense, right? I mean, would you want to hit yourself? Well, then if you don't want to get hit, then you shouldn't hit other people, right? Right? If you're going to do say nasty things about yourself, then, you know, um, why? If you don't like that, then why would you do it to your neighbor, right? But conversely, if you do that to yourself, if you don't like who you are, if you are nitpicky about who you are, oh, I'm a sinner, I'm bad at this, I'm bad at that, then conversely, what are you doing to your neighbor? You're probably doing the same thing to your neighbor, okay? Because that's the benchmark, okay? Now, God, now Jesus in the upper room will even give us a higher commandment, you know? The higher commandment is love others as I have loved you. Now, that's even higher. So this second commandment that Jesus is giving you, giving us is the bare minimum, to love our neighbor as ourselves. In the upper room, he's going to give us a better commandment that says, love others as Christ loves us. Now, that's even higher. It's even a higher calling. But for right now, we're going to say how important it is to love yourself. And yet, how many Catholics do we meet that don't do that? That truly do not love who they are? They're very confused, you know? They are. And there's this false sense of humility. There's this false sense of, of, uh, of who they are. Now, so why does it matter if I love myself? Why does Jesus want us to love ourselves, right? So because the number one reason why is because you are lovable, you know? God, you know, loves you. All right. So I'm going to give you uh, about eight reasons why 
it matters whether you love yourself or not. Number one, are you better than God? Hmm? So you just said, you answered the question, and these, these potential tertiaries answered the question, and they said, yeah, I believe that God loves me. You know, I believe that God loves me, okay, and that he suffered for me, he died for me, Our Lady loves me, then why don't you love yourself? If God suffered and died for you because he loves you, because he loves you, then why don't you love yourself? Are you better than God? Are you smarter than God? You have something hidden from God or some secret that he doesn't know. I don't think so. God created you. God knew you before you were even formed in your womb. God is omniscient, meaning he's all-knowing. So there is nothing that is hidden from him. He knows everything. He knows the sin that you, you've done. He knows everything about you. He knows me, David Cease, and all the sins that I've committed. Okay? And I can tell you, I've committed some bad sins. All right? From my high school years to my college years, and even now. Yet he still loves me. He loves me for who I am, but he also loves me knowing that I could be more than who I am, okay? That's what great parents know, that great parents love who their children are, even with their faults, but have hopes and aspirations for them to become better than what they even think they can be, right? They can blossom into this beautiful person rather than just living in diapers, right? I wouldn't expect my daughter to live in diapers when she's 24 years old or 30 years old or she needed to be fed uh, by a spoon or milk. Eventually she grows up, she's self-sufficient. That's what God expects us. But I know my daughter makes mistakes. I know my son makes mistakes. You know, we have this idea that God is maybe this this ogreish kind of a father that just wants to pounce on us as soon as we make the first mistake, Right? You know, and that is not the case. My children have made plenty of mistakes as a father, and I would never expect them to make them. I don't go looking for them and just say, Ooh, I can't wait until they make that first mistake. Because as soon as they make that first mistake, I'm gonna pounce on them like a like a lion and I'm gonna punish them forever. Forever, right? No, God is not that way. God loves you for who you are. And he wants the greatness to come out of you because you have a potential to be great. That's what you have. So God knows all your sins. God knows that. But God also knows your heart. And if you have a desire to love God back, if you have the desire to want to glorify him, if you have the desire to be great to do his will, then he will do that for you. So there should be no reason why you shouldn't love yourself. Because if an all-loving God has given you this beautiful love, and he died for you, shed his blood, you know, one drop of his blood is worth Jesus' blood, one drop of it is worth all the gold, all the silver, all the platinum, whatever it is, the most expensive thing, all the money in the universe. One drop. And yet he didn't just shed one drop. He shed all of his blood. And he sacrificed his whole body. It was ripped in shreds. That's how much he loves you. And we can't love ourselves? That's crazy. So if God loves you, you're not better than God. You should love yourself. The second reason is, you know, how can you love your neighbor if you don't love yourself, right? It's the old adage, you can't give what you don't have, right? You can't give what you don't have. If you cannot love yourself, then how do you expect to love your neighbor? That's the bare minimum benchmark, 
That's what Jesus is giving us, is the bare minimum benchmark. Because the greatest benchmark is when he gives us the new commandment in the upper room, which is loving others as Jesus loves them. So the bare minimum is to love our neighbor as ourself. And if we don't love ourselves, and if we treat ourselves, whether bodily, spiritually, or whatever it is, harmfully, then the chances are we're going to do that to our neighbors. Okay? If we can't see the good in ourselves, then how are we seeing the good in others? Okay? So you can't give what you don't have. And we are called to love our neighbors. A lot of times what happens is that people are seeking love rather than giving love. Because they don't love themselves, what really winds up happening is when they're looking for that other person, they're looking for the, uh, they're looking for love in themselves. You know, I was, uh, I was watching um, uh, the song uh, called Secret Garden by Bruce Springsteen. And it's from, it was one of the theme songs from a movie called uh, Jerry Maguire. It had, uh, uh, what was the movie? Um, it had uh, Tom Cruise in it. And it's about this relationship. Uh, and they kind of come together. And it was basically a business relationship that blossomed into, you know, so-called a loving relationship. But the person doesn't, you know, really commit to loving this, this, the woman. So at the end of the movie, he realizes, hey, I love this woman. So Tom Cruise, you see him, he's flying back and he runs through the airport and he runs to the girlfriend and he opens up the door and with loving eyes, he says to this girlfriend, you complete me. You complete me. That's not love. That is not love at all. Okay. True love says, what can I do to you for my spouse? Not, what is this spouse doing for me? You completely, right? Jesus, grace, and the Holy Spirit is what completes me, okay? That's what completes me. God completes me, and I am called to love my spouse or the person that I'm called to marry. Nothing here in, on earth completes us, Okay? We are incomplete. That's the truth. But if nothing here on earth can complete us because we have an infinite capacity to love and receive that love. And that reception of that love can only be fulfilled and be completed by an infinite God who loves us. And so a lot of times when we don't love ourselves, we wind up trying to be loved and we'll join organizations that make us feel like we're loved. You know, maybe it's that, you know, soup kitchen, you know, because I feel I'm appreciated. You know, they say such wonderful things about me. Or maybe because I feel fulfilled because I'm helping someone out. Or maybe I'm, I'm fulfilled because I'm helping, you know, this, this person who's drunk and an alcoholic. Rather than realizing that I, I'm here to call to love someone. So... We have to, in essence, um, love ourselves so that we don't have something here on earth trying to fulfill us, make us loved, so that we can truly love others. That's why great saints were able to love others with a pure and genuine heart because they didn't need to be fulfilled by some earthly person or object. Number three, be at peace with yourself. You know, if you don't love yourself, it's going to be very difficult to live on earth, okay? Because you're, you're tied to yourself, okay? You can't run away from yourself, you know? Like, uh, you know, you can always run away from your spouse or your children or whatever, and you see a lot of people doing that, but you can't run away from yourself, right? So you're, you're going to have a troubling life. Be at peace. Love who you are, the good and the bad, the ugly and the sad, the beauty. I can find a lot of beauty in everyone, and I can find a lot of ugliness in everyone as well. But love who you are, 
and strive to be greater than who you are. So be at peace. If you don't love yourself, you're going to have a tough time, okay? So because you're going to have to live with yourself for the rest of your life. Number four, the value of your sacrifice is based on the value of yourself, okay? So, you know, you look at martyrs, right? Um, just last Friday was the feast of St. Uh, uh, Luis uh, Ruiz. He was a, um, a Filipino. Actually, he was half Chinese, half Filipino. His father was Chinese. Um, but he was born and raised in the Philippines because his, his mother was Filipino. And uh, he was married. He was a husband. And he, he was falsely accused. So he left to go to Japan and in Japan, there was a persecution going on, and he uh, was martyred there in Japan. But, you know, we look at it and say, do, do you think that the great martyrs like Luis Ruiz were suicidal maniacs? You know, like they, they were just bonsai uh, attackers, like the Japanese soldiers, you know, kamikazes. You think ma- martyrs are kamikazes? You know, they don't care about life, you know? I remember, um, uh, you know, the Marines, when they were fighting in World War II, and the Japanese were, were sacri- literally sacrificing their uh, lives. If you look at Guad- the Battle of Guadalcanal, Marines were shooting machine guns uh, at Japanese bonsai attacks, and there were literally thousands and thousands of Japanese killed doing suicide bonsai attacks. And then towards the end of the war, they were doing kamikaze attacks where these planes would, um, uh, the, the pilots of the planes would, would, you know, basically sacrifice their lives to blow up an aircraft carrier, you know, and, and do that. No, martyrs are not kamikazes. They're not bonsai attackers. They're not like the Muslim martyrs where they blow themselves up, where they don't care about their lives. Marines used to say, you know what? The Japanese can die for their country, but I want to live for my country. Okay? The value of life is important for the Catholic. Okay? Martyrs, <laughs> they value their lives. And they value their lives so much. Okay? Because that's what makes martyrdom so great. Right? Right? Martyrdom is great because they value their lives greatly. When Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane and he said, Father, if it be your will, take this cup away from me. He valued his life. You know, he didn't say, oh, Lord, I hate my life. You know, just let's get it over with right now. No, he valued it because the value of his sacrifice was the value he had of his life. And the precious blood, the precious body, the precious being called Jesus Christ has such high value that when he died on the cross, it is worth more than anything else in the whole universe. And Our Lady recognized that. And the value of Our Lady's sacrifice is high because she, she did not deserve to watch her son die. That was her own martyrdom. So all the great saints valued their lives. Yet they made the decision to say, but I love God more. And I'm willing to offer this high value life that I consider precious. Life is precious. But I offer it to Jesus as a witness to my faith and as a witness to convert souls. That is true martyrdom. That has high value. You know, when we look at celibacy of a priest, celibacy doesn't cheapen marriage. You know, the Catholic Church doesn't say, oh, you know, celibacy is so great because marriage is cheap. Okay? No. Marriage has such an excellent worth. It's elevated to a sacrament. It is the greatest love that man can ever receive here on earth. 
This is why if you look at uh, scripture readings, whether it's in the book of Revelation or what Jesus talks about, he always references a marriage. And the relationship of Israel and God is always a marriage. The relationship between God and the church is about a marriage. Because marriage reflects the love bond between the soul of a person and God. That's how elevated the marriage is. And that's what makes celibacy so great. Because a man and a religious who takes a vow of of, uh, chastity is sacrificing something that is worth so much. That's why it has great value. It's the same thing. Martyrdom has great value because life has great value. So that was number four. Number five, faith, hope, and love abides, but the greatest is love. If you're not loving yourself, then you're not exercising the virtue of love. Now, that's humanistic love. So the first thing that we must do is love ourselves, and we are exercising the virtue of love. All right? We, that's what we're doing. We are loving ourselves. Don't let pride, Satan, or the world get in the way of love. At the end of the day, the reason why we do not love ourselves is because of pro- either pride. Oh, I'm not lovable. I, I, I can't love myself because I'm not lovable. Oh, my goodness. If Jesus loves you, if God loves you for who you are, then you are lovable. And, there, and there's no one that God does not love here on earth. But it, it's our pride that gets in the way, okay? As if I know better than God, as if I am better than God, right? No. That's what Judas said. Judas committed suicide. I mean, you, you look at the sin of Judas and the sin of Peter, Okay, they both betrayed Jesus. You know that? Jesus was betrayed by Peter. You know? But Judas could not say, I'm lovable. Judas can say, you know what? Gee, God still loves me. And I want to love him back. And Jesus says to Peter, Peter, do you love me? And then Peter says, yes, I love you. Right? It's about love. So it's only pride. That was the difference between Peter and Judas. Judas had so much pride, he could not find love. And so he killed himself. And Satan, okay? Satan and the world wants to lie to you. Okay? They, they want to they wanna mislead you. They want to give you half-truths. Okay? So... They want to make you think that you are not lovable. That's what they want to make you believe. You're not lovable. But you know what? The world will love you. That's who will love you. And so we'll go off trying to seek love in all the wrong places. That's what the world does. And Satan will want you to do that. Okay? Why? Why does Satan want you... And why does the world want you to uh, chase after that? The main reason why is because the reason why is if you are not glorifying God, then, you know, you're falling short. Now, I want to say something about this, okay? I am a firm believer that even though I said this, um, that Satan and the world never lie. You know, you know that whole saying, Satan is the father of lies. He does not lie. Okay. He only gives half truths. He's a deceiver. That's what he is. And the world deceives as well, but they don't lie. He tells the truth, but he uses half truths. That's what he uses. The world and Satan uses half-truths to deceive. And and how is that? You know, if you look at Protestantism, right, what what is the 
they say, are we justified by faith? And Protestants will say, we're justified by faith alone. But the Catholic Church says, no, 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 no. It's faith and works. Again, it's the world and Satan saying, here's the truth. We're justified by faith. And that is the truth. The Catholic Church will say we're justified by faith, but not alone. Not alone. That's the difference between Protestants and Catholics. Okay? Or the authority issue. Right? Protestants will say we are, you know, we have the authority. Scripture is the authority. And the Catholic Church will say, you're absolutely right. Scripture is authority, but not alone. Right? Not alone. So there, here it goes the same thing with self-esteem. The world and the devil will say, you need to love yourself. And the Catholic Church will say the same thing. And Jesus says the same thing. You need to love yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. Where the half-truth comes into play is this. Satan and the world will say, you need to love yourself because you're pretty, because you're strong, because you're smart, because you're successful, because of all these things that you do. You're a great musician, right? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All the talents that God has given us, you know, and beauty is a talent. That's what Satan will want to say uh, that you are lovable for. Why? Why? The reason why is that he, they, Jesus, the, the Satan and the world wants you to use those talents to glorify yourself. That's why. These talents that Jesus gave us are there to glorify God, Right? The story of the talents, who gets the interest? The master. It wasn't the servant. We are to use our talents to glorify God. But instead, Satan says, oh, no, that beauty that God has given you, that intellect that God has given you, that strength, that success that he's given you is for you so that you can be lovable, that you can be loved. And so you have all these people who are chasing after an illusion. Best case scenario, they don't succeed. That's the best case scenario. Because then they f- fall flat in their face and they realize, oh my goodness, that's just an illusion. Okay? And hopefully they'll come back to the church. Worst case scenario is they are successful. They become a movie star. They become all these things. And now they think that They're lovable because they are pretty, because they are famous, because they are strong, because they're a great athlete. And all those talents, the problem with talents is God giveth and God can take it away. Car accident. One day you're strong, the next day you're out. A disease. One day you're pretty, the next day you're not. God giveth and he can take it away. And when we build our lovability based off of these talents, which will eventually are fleeting and they'll go away, it becomes a house of cards. It becomes a foundation of sand rather than a a rock foundation. That's the key. So Satan and the world and the Catholic Church agrees. Love yourself. Where we disagree is what is the basis of our love, right? Satan and the world will say, it's all your talents. It's your strength. It's your looks. It's your success. And he has you chasing after those things on yourself to glorify yourself, wasting your time, and not glorifying God. So at the end of the day, When God looks at you and says, what did you do with the talents that I gave you? You're going to have only one thing, and that is I wasted it on myself. Just like that, 
the servant that buried it because he was afraid. So the that's what Satan will say. Now we'll give you why. We'll give you what the Catholic Church's reason why to love yourself. But let me finish. Um, why does it matter if I love myself? Okay. So the next is true humility. Okay. True humility. All right. True humility says I'm lovable because I am a child of God. And I became a child of God through baptism because God made me a child of God through the sacrament of baptism. And that sacrament was given to me by him. His son, Jesus Christ, gave the power of baptism. And it's been given to priests and to other lay members to baptize, to make them a child of God. It's nothing that I've done, but everything that God has done, right? That's what true humility is. We are nothing, but in God's eyes, we are everything. And that is the truth. We are nothing, but it is God's doing that gives us everything. And one of them was the sacrament of baptism. So that's true humility. It's not my talents that make me, you know, lovable. It's not my doing, right? I'm only lovable if I'm pretty. I'm only lovable if I'm successful. I'm only lovable if I'm strong or I'm an athlete or a musician. That's all my strength. That's just me. But you're lovable because you're a child of God. And you were made a child of God when that priest or deacon said, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. That is the reason why. Nothing that you did, everything that God did. Taking criticism, okay? Last reason why you should love yourself is taking criticism so that you can grow in virtue. Why do people get defensive, right? People get defensive. I, you know, I get defensive every once in a while, you know. But the more I can learn to love who I am, who I really am with my faults, with my strengths, with, you know, everything... I can take criticism very easily because I love myself. I don't need to have my kids praising me every day. I don't need my wife praising me every day because I love who I am because I'm a child of God. So if I have faults and my children point them out to me like they did to uh, several weeks ago where they t- you know, were just you know, making fun of me because I still have anger management issues, um, then that's fine. I don't need to defend myself. I don't need to seek love and affirmation from my children, from my wife, from anyone. My affirmation comes from God. Now, I can look at criticism with an open eye and try to grow in virtue. That is important to understand. That we can grow in virtue if we really, really learn to love ourselves and and not get defensive. This is why if you look at some of the great saints and they were humiliated, truly, truly, truly humiliated, okay, it didn't bother them because they love who they are. And that is because they love that they are a child of God. Now, what is the basis of loving myself? And I gave you the big hint. You're a child of God. That's what you are. That's the basis of loving yourself, right? Nothing that you did. You don't need to climb Mount Kilimanjaro like I did. You don't need to be a success, you know, be a millionaire, zillionaire, you know. You don't need to find some new discovery, you know. You do that 
maybe to glorify God, but you don't need to do it to be lovable. Jesus explains to us the importance of being a child of God in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 18. And he says, at that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them and said, Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child, he is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. See, Jesus is telling us that we should love ourselves on the basis that we are a child of God. When we act like children glorifying God the Father. And there's nothing that you did to become a child of God. And most of us, if you're a cradle Catholic, your mom did it or your parents did it. They brought you to church and voila, the priest said, the priest or the deacon said, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Poured a little bit of water on you. Whammo. You're a child of God. Lovable. Okay. So that is the basis of our love. And when we realize that, you would want everyone to be baptized. Evangelization occurs only if you realize what people are missing out on, right? So many people, Catholics, oh, after Vatican II, you know, no one needs to be Catholic. I mean, it's, there's, there's, no one's going to get damned. There's no going to be, there's no, you know, everyone's saved, right? Uh, you know what? True or not, I don't know. I'm not a theologian. But one thing I do know is that the grace of being a child of God, to me, is so important that every other religion is missing out on that. Think about that. They're missing out on being a child of God through the grace received through the sacrament. And we're, I'm going to explain to you exactly what does that mean by being a child of God. Right? So the, the important thing is that we're a child of God. So what does that mean? That means we are royalty. That's what we are. Right? Right? If Jesus is king, and I said this to the, the tertiaries, and he's our brother, what does that make us? Royalty, prince, princesses. If Mary is queen of the universe and she is our mother, what does that make us? Royalty. And the words of baptism says that. As Christ was priest, prophet, and king, so you are baptized into that same priesthood, that same royalty. You are royalty. This is why we love stories about kings and queens and princes and, and prince, because we are prince and princesses. You're the most beautiful prince and princess ever. That's what I tell my kids. And that's legitimately true. Because Jesus is king, who's our brother, and Mary is our mother, and she's queen. Queen of heaven and earth. So we're royalty. The next thing is that we've been divinized. Yes, sounds like heretical, right? That we're gods, right? We are. We're gods, okay? We partake... In the nature of God. We receive God through the Eucharist. We've been divinized. Okay? Wow. Everyone wants to be a God. Right? If you see these great people, oh, I'm, I'm a God. You know? Or they're pseudo-gods. Or they're, you know, um, whatever. But you are a God through baptism. Listen to this. This is from the Catechism of the Catholic Church, who is quoting St. Athanasius. Okay? It says, The Word became flesh to make us partakers of the divine nature. 
so that man, by entering into communion with the word and thus receiving divine sonship, might become a son of God. For the son of God became man so that we might become God. Okay? Yes. God became man so man could become God. Now, we are not the begotten sons and daughters. We are adopted sons and daughters. But God's word is extremely powerful, right? God's word, they say that God can't lie because he really can't lie. Whenever he says something, it happens, right? Unlike us, we can say something and not make it happen. But God, when he says, when he declares something, it happens. So when he declared us children of God, that is what we are, as St. John said. We truly are. We partake in that nature which we call grace, okay, in that world. So we are divinized. Wow. We are divinized. We are seeking such great powers. And we are given the power of grace. And power of grace gives us the power of love. Love is the most, that is the greatest power Anywhere. Anywhere. So humanistic love is even extremely powerful. But divine love, as exemplified on the cross, is even more powerful. So we are gods. The next is that your life is worth the shedding of God's blood. Think about that. And I mentioned this before. One single drop of Jesus' blood is worth more than all the gold, silver, platinum, whatever in the universe. And yet he shed more than just that. <coughs> he shed all of his blood and he shredded his whole body for us. Okay? Now, this is why sin is so evil. There's only one way that we stop being a child of God. We disconnect ourselves from the family of God. There's only one way, and that is through mortal sin. Can you see why mortal sin is so evil? You know, I agree that, you know what? Mortal sin hurts other people, and it does. Some visibly, some not invisibly, or some uh, visibly. So, but the most important thing that sin does is it severs us from God. And all the beauty that is inside of us by being a child of God is gone. It's gone. Think of it this way. Satan or Lucifer was once a child of God. He was an angel of God. Pure, loved by God. Because all the angels, even the evil one, evil the devils, were at one time created good. Because God does not create evil. At one time, they were good and loving perfect and beautiful beautiful but through pride satan fell and he became ugly he became ugly you know the irony of the whole his name lucifer if you study what lucifer means it means light bearer his title, his name, Lucifer, shows how great he was, how beautiful he must have been, because he carried the light. And St. Thomas says, the closer you are to God, right, Our Lady is the closest to God, and the more beautiful you are, 
That's why Our Lady is the most beautiful creature ever. Because she not only is close to God, but she had she bore God. The title Lucifer, Satan should have lost as well. Because the real Lucifer is actually Our Lady. Our Lady is the Lucifer, the light bearer. She bore the light for nine months. Nine whole months, she bore the light. Literally, right? In her womb. She's the true Lucifer. Lucifer also means morning star. What do we call Our Lady? The morning star. The morning star that guides us in the night gives us the hope until the sun rises. And who is the sun? But her son, Jesus. Lucifer is truly the Eve. That's what it was. He, Lucifer fell. He was the light bearer. He actually should have been what Mary was. Imagine that. But through pride, he sinned and said, no, I will not serve. I will not serve. And he became ugly. And when we commit mortal sin, we become ugly, just like Lucifer. And we lose our title, just like Lucifer. Lucifer lost the light. Lucifer became ugly because our beauty and our lovability comes from being with the light. Remember going back to true humility? It's not us that makes us beautiful. It's not us that makes us great. We are nothing. It's God that gives us everything. And it's free. He gives it to us. We don't need to earn it. Okay? It's not like Marine Corps boot camp where you have to earn to be a Marine. No. You just need a priest and our deacon to say the words, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And pour a little bit of water and you're a child of God. And the rest of our lives, we want to make sure that we stay as a child of God. And not only that, but we want to then use our talents to glorify God, you know, to glorify God through those talents. That's what children of God do. Children of God will use their talents that God has given us to glorify Him. That's what Satan should have done. Satan should have glorified God but he couldn't because he didn't want to serve. But what does Our Lady say? Do it unto me according to thy word. And then after that, the Holy Spirit descends on her. She bears that light. She becomes the real Lucifer, the real light bearer. And then she goes to the visitation to Elizabeth. And what does she say there? My soul magnifies the Lord. My soul magnifies the Lord. And that is exactly what we are called to do. My soul, she's saying in essence, my soul glorifies God. Because she just said, yes, I will serve. I will be the mother of Jesus, mother of God. I will serve. And then she uses her talents to glorify, to magnify God. And that's what we're called. As soon as we became a child of God, we became a light bearer. We become little Lucifers, okay? Little light bearers, right? This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, right? We're becoming a Lucifer. We're becoming a light bearer. We then, once we become the light bearer, we then glorify God. That's what we do. We glorify Him through our talents. But no, God would want, I'm sorry, Satan and the world would want you to say, no, 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 no. Your talents are there to glorify you. That's what Satan did. Satan wanted to use his talents. 
I'm so smart, I want to glorify myself. And St. Michael comes and he says, and St. Michael's name is, who is like God? Who is like God? See, Satan wanted to use his talents that God had given him to glorify himself. Do you see that connection? That's why Satan and the world wants you to glorify yourself through your talents and tell you, you're so beautiful. You're so strong. You could be lovable this way. Come follow me. You're following in the footsteps of Satan and Lucifer who used their talents to glorify themselves instead of glorifying God. And it's a house of cards. It's a house of cards. It's an illusion when really you are lovable because you're a child of God. God loves you. So our rest of our lives, we love ourselves because we're a child of God. We're a prince in this, his kingdom. We are princes in his kingdom. We are divinized. We are godlike. And we want to make sure we maintain that by not sinning, by not committing mortal sin. And if we do commit mortal sin, to come back through confession and then using our talents to glorify God. That's the second part. That's where people miss the boat. You know, I see a lot of Catholics, oh, I'm, I'm a child of God. That's great. And then they just sit there like there's just some kind of a, you know, couch potato, as Pope Francis would say. But we need to glorify God, just like Our Lady. Once Our Lady received God, Jesus, when she said, be it done to me according to thy word, and the Holy Spirit descended on her, and she became pregnant by the Holy Spirit, she conceived by the Holy Spirit, first thing she did, the visitation, went to Elizabeth. And what does she say there? Humble Humble Mary, my soul magnifies the Lord, right? This is humble Mary. My soul will magnify the Lord because she knows that she's going to use the talents to magnify that, her, the, uh, the Lord. And that's what God does. God gives you those talents to magnify God. But what do we do? We, we, we hide that, right? So God calls us. You could be a successful businessman. You could be a successful athlete, a a songwriter, or whatever. But are we doing it at the cost of our soul? Are we doing it in a Christian manner? Are you being that Christian, you know, businessman who is promoting Christian values, who are promoting Christian, you know, uh, teachings? Or are we just, you know... Uh, making our our spirituality into this, you know, self enclosed. Well, it's just about me. Well, that's not that's not what it is. If you truly love who you are, you will promote it. You won't be afraid of saying grace at lunch in front of all the business people. You won't be afraid of talking about Christ. You won't be afraid of engaging the world with charity and love, with sincerity, with hope, with joy. You know, I rarely had confrontations when it came to religion. Yeah, I've deeply moved people. I bring hope. Many times I'll say, I'll pray for you. I bring joy. And I wear, you know, a rosary band, miraculous medal. They know that I'm deeply Catholic. They don't... I don't need to preach about Jesus. I need to live it in my heart and in my actions. And so that's how we glorify God. We can glorify God through our talents in our business world, but not be afraid of expressing our Catholic teaching. And, you know, we use, you know, I remember I was talking to a friend of mine. I said, where's your miraculous medal? Why don't you wear it? He's like, oh, no, company policy doesn't allow that. Well, you know what? I don't think that's the case. No company policy can say you you can't wear, all right, a miraculous medal. That would be anti-religious, which is against, 
you know, um, I, f- I forget what amendment it is. But you, unless there's a safety reason why you can't do it, but there is, you know, a ways to evangelize being joyful. So I hope you learn that we are called to love ourselves so that we can then love others. But that source of love of ourselves comes from the fact that we are a child of God. Now let's end it with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear Lord Jesus, I pray that um, we recognize that we are your children, that we are lovable, that we are called to love ourselves, and then we can truly love our neighbors. May we reflect the image of your Son. May we become true Christians and love as he did. As we pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Thank you for listening to me, David Cease, at Practical Catholic. Here's a reflection for you. Take a moment and reflect. Do you really believe you are a child of God? Feel free to share your reflection or leave a comment on the podcast, Instagram, and Facebook and Facebook at Practical Catholic or visit my webpage at Practical Catholic One, that is the number one dot com. Join me next week as we discuss the topic fake people created by lack of self esteem. You're listening to WCAT Radio, the on air wing of Enroute Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom.